people who have congestive heart failure or who have swelling in their feet or their lower legs, one of the things that happens when you lay down is that all that fluid gets reabsorbed from your feet and legs and it's pumped back to your heart because you're now flat and your heart has to dispose of all that extra fluid and it hits your kidneys. So if you have swelling in your lower legs, uh, that's usually the culprit. One of the things you can do early in the evening is stretch yourself out on a couch while you're watching TV or better yet, do exercise snacking where you just do some jumping jacks or dance to a music for, you know, two to three minutes and pump that extra fluid back to your heart before you go to bed. Now, the second thing that happens is a great number of us, unfortunately, drink a lot of water or drink alcohol for dinner or late into the evening. And that water has to go somewhere. And so first things first, don't have that glass of water before you go to bed. Secondly, please stay up after drinking alcohol because another thing that's going to really wake you up is that alcohol wearing off about two to three hours after you go to bed and you'll be wide awake. Finally, many, many people unwittingly are woken up by sleep apnea and that sudden need to take a breath because quite frankly, you've become hypoxic. You have low oxygen levels. One of the best ways if your partner tells you you're snoring, please take that seriously. That snoring is not normal. Get yourself an aura ring, which I have on here. They're relatively affordable. I have no relationship with them, except I'm a big fan and an early adapter. And aura rings can actually watch the num and report the number of times you have episodes of drop in oxygen saturation uh, on your nightly report. And if you see that as a common occurrence, or if you see that that episode correlates with you waking up wanting to go to the bathroom, then it's time to get a sleep apnea study. And they're actually easy to obtain. They can even be done now at home. You don't have to be overnighted in a sleep apnea center. So last, any other tricks? Well, Dave Asprey recently mentioned using raw honey or MCT oil to help. Uh, I certainly haven't seen that in my practice, but uh, I'm not a huge fan of raw honey in the first place uh, because, sorry, it's still fructose. Does it have some interesting prebiotics and possibly probiotics? Yes, it does. But I think the benefit outweighs the risk or the risk outweigh the benefit. Again, try D-Manos, particularly if you're a woman and see what happens. Okay. Now I know what you're saying. I just wake up at two to three o'clock every morning and it has nothing to do with needing to pee and I can't go back to sleep. And I hear that all the time from a lot of my patients. First of all, once again, please, please, please do not have a heavy meal or drink alcohol and then go to sleep. It's nearly a guarantee that you'll be up in two or three hours. Many of my patients are woken up with heartburn or GERD, and that's what wakes them up. One of my tricks, uh, and remember I was a cardiothoracic surgeon for most of my career, and we operated on people with GERD, heartburn. And one of the things that we learned very early is we could prevent a lot of heartburn and GERD by having our patients sleep on their side, their left side. Now, what happens when you sleep on your left side is you actually, you trap a lot of air 
in the top part of your stomach called the fundus. And it actually pushes up on your left diaphragm. And it's actually one of the main causes of hiccups, by the way. But if you sleep on your left side, that air is basically forced out of your stomach in the form of belching or burping. And that air no longer is going to actually push contents out of your stomach. Now, how do you sleep on your side? Well, get yourself some big pillows and put one behind you and one in front of you. There are actually devices, pillows that you can buy on the internet that force you to sleep on your left side. Finally, get yourself a lot of dogs. We have four dogs on our bed and invariably one or two of the dogs luckily lean against my left side, uh, my backside, and kind of force me onto my side. Lastly, I should mention, get yourself dogs that don't want to get up in the middle of the night to go pee. That's a very important consideration that I'm still trying to teach my rescue dogs to do. Finally, listen to your spouse or significant other. If they tell you you're snoring, take that seriously and get yourself a test because that, quite frankly, can save your life. And one of the classic signs of sleep apnea is this waking up at night and can't get back to sleep. Finally, it could be something very physiologic. Around four o'clock in the morning, normally, a hormone called cortisol, the arousal hormone, begins normally rising to get you ready for the morning. It raises norepinephrine adrenaline to get your blood pumping, to actually raise your blood pressure so that when you step out of bed being prone, you don't faint when you fall out of bed. The other thing it's trying to do is mobilize sugar so that, believe it or not, you don't faint from lack of sugar when you get up and you'll have plenty of glucose before you break your fast, break fast, to get you going in the morning. And sometimes it's just a simple sleep process that is entirely normal. One of the benefits of having dogs is that they will usually get you up around sunrise. And quite frankly, my wife and I get up about five o'clock in the morning because that's the time to get up if you have dogs. Uh, so those are the tricks. If you find that late morning, you know, like four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, you just can't get back to sleep. That's actually a sign that your cortisol is working properly. And a lot of times get a dog and you won't have to fight it anymore. So what causes snoring? Well, there's a lot of potential causes. First of all, some people, particularly with not a very prominent chin, unwittingly when they sleep, their tongue falls into the back of their mouth. And the tongue falling back into the back of your throat is actually causing obstructive sleep apnea and snoring. Now that one is actually a remarkably easy fix. The first thing I do with my patients who are snorers like this is I do not let them sleep on their back. And that's one of the first tricks to use. I like my patients to sleep on their left side and I've posted another video on the benefits of left-sided sleeping. You can use two large pillows to prop yourself on your side. There are pillow-like devices that you can get on the internet, and you just type in anti-snoring pillows, and you'll actually find uh, a number of them that actually are very successful at putting you on your side. For the most part, that will keep your tongue from falling in the back of your mouth, throat. There are dental devices that are available to pull your jaw forward. 
And a lot of times these work. I like to send my patients to a holistic dentist who specializes in snoring treatments, many times ear, nose, and throat physicians, ENTs, otolaryngologists also will have specialized devices for this purpose. And finally, quite frankly, weight loss is my most effective treatment for snoring. Why weight loss? Well, it turns out that we put, remarkably, a lot of fat storage in our mouth, cheeks, and neck. And that fat can actually contribute to compromising your airway. And invariably, when patients go on my program for another reason, say it's for the treatment of diabetes or the treatment of an autoimmune disease, treatment of arthritis. One of the side effects that the spouse notices is that their husband or wife stops snoring. Oftentimes, I have patients return from a trip to Europe for several weeks, found that they were snoring over in Europe, and when they came back, they discovered that they had gained, oh, five, seven pounds. And as soon as that trip weight fell off, the snoring disappeared. Finally, a lot of my snoring patients or their spouses or significant others notice that the snoring corresponds to when they've had either or too much to drink or too much to eat late at night. And alcohol in and of itself will change the motor tone, the muscular tone in your airways. And again, listen to your bedmate. And if your bedmate notices that this is the trend, that's an easy fix. Either stay up for a few hours, let that food and the alcohol digest, or simply don't eat late into the night, don't drink, and then go to bed. So those are great tricks. How do you rid yourself of insomnia? Well, so insomnia has many, many, many contributions. We know that an abnormal gut microbiome is a big source of insomnia. We know that viewing blue light late into the evening, watching TV screens, watching your phone, watching, reading on a computer are great ways to keep you awake. Uh, eating close to bedtime is a great way to keep you awake. Uh, recently in the Energy Paradox wrote about this trick, which is kind of fun to try. Uh, get yourself some glycine capsules. Glycine is an amino acid. Take about three grams of glycine right before you go to bed. Glycine, inter interestingly, drops your body temperature. And strange but true, you have to have a drop in body temperature to induce sleep. That's another thing. Get yourself one of these new cooling mattresses. It really works. Uh, the other thing for some people is get yourself one of the heavy blankets and you know wrap yourself like a toddler in it. Another trick. In other words, eliminate the causes that are keeping you from falling asleep. And in my books, I've got lots of tricks with other supplements for uh, helping you initiate sleep. Hard charging Americans say, well, I'll sleep when I'm dead. That's the least thing I have to worry about. Uh, but in fact, we know that you know, lack of sleep uh, kills you. Uh, I mean, it definitely shortens your lifespan. Uh, we know that blue zone people in general get eight 
to 10 hours of sleep a night, and they actually frequently take naps. Where is the science now? How much can somebody get by on four to five hours of sleep, or are they going to pay for it eventually? Or is there a range where each of us needs, and how do you, how do you find that out? Big question. Yeah. Most, most people need seven to nine hours of sleep a night. And there is variability. You know, there are people who have this genetic mutation that it's a very, very small percentage of people who may be able to get by with less than that, right? But most people, by far, majority of the people need about seven to nine hours of sleep. And you're absolutely right. I think we, we have a massive uh, sort of epidemic of lack of sleep that is going on. And and, um, and I mean, some of the stats you mentioned were quite, 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 quite stark. Um, one of the stats that I know is that you have one in five car crashes are caused by drowsy sort of driving, right? And that basically, in, just in the U.S., results in about 7,000 deaths a year. Right? So it is a matter of life and death, literally, right, when, you come, when it comes to, to lack of sleep. Um, and then there are all these other, other potential long-term effects like you know, there's been linked with uh, these these proteins building up in your in your brain, um, beta amyloids and tau's, um, and that are linked with potentially causing Alzheimer's in the long term. So, so and then there are also also risks for hypertension, diabetes. Um, you know, it affects your immune system. So there there is there is a whole lot of science um, behind sort of sleep as probably one of the best things you can do for yourself to improve your health and in multiple different ways, both sort of short-term improvements as well as longer-term improvements to your health. Um, and, and, you know, around this, this aspect of getting enough sleep helps you improve your health. I don't think there is much debate around that, at least, you know, fr from, from a scientific point of view. I think sleep is... is um, is, is quite quite critical for, for functioning. And it's sort of like um, an, an essential biological need for, for, for humans and animals too, right? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. When I was a, um, a surgery resident, um, surgeons, uh, I remember when I, I went to the University of Michigan uh, for my training, and I, I came from... Georgia Medical School, where we actually, as medical students, uh, worked through the night. And when I go into Michigan, uh, the medical students on my service said, well, you know, it's five o'clock, uh, we're going home now. And I go, well, what do you mean you're going home? The most important stuff is going to happen, you know, tonight at, at two o'clock in the morning. And they said, no, we're not allowed to be here at night. We have to get our sleep. And I'm going, are you crazy? You know, uh, they were, and this was, you know, a long time ago, and they were actually well, way ahead of the curve. And we now, residency programs uh, have controls on how long you can, you know, be on call, how long you can be awake. Uh, when I was chief resident, I went four days without sleep on the chairman's service. And then I slept for four hours and, and went at it again. And... Oh. Yeah, and we now know that, wow, you know, that's like me driving a race car uh, without sleep. You know, clearly everybody had impaired judgment. Now, luckily, yeah. I don't think I killed anybody, but, um, but that was sort of the culture. And we now know that that's, uh, that's crazy. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that is one of our, you know, one of the... the uh, our missions, like our, you know, what what Aura wants to do is sort of this ma making health a daily practice. And I think the simple act of, you know, you mentioned that the first thing you do in the morning when you know your wife your wife might ask you how did you sleep and you go to your Aura, and it's it's this act of checking in, right? Simply trying to be mindful about how did you sleep, right? I think for me there are lots of benefits of Aura and like the data and the insights, but the 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 biggest one in my mind is is this um, a change in your mindset about checking in, right? The first thing in your morning and thinking about how did I sleep and, and you know, let me understand this. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, as we, as more people use Aura Rings and, and, and in general, I think the, the awareness of the importance of sleep becomes um, 
you know, more widespread. I'm, I'm hoping that all of these, we will see improvements across a lot of these other uh, aspects, right? Like long-term impacts on health, in, you know, and also the shorter term impacts that you, you know, sleep has on your, on your ability to perform and, and, um, you know, um, uh, be well in, in during the day. Hey, you mentioned something earlier that I think is an important message. I, I want to, I want to talk about that. Many of us have been taught that, well, uh, during the work week, we have so much to do, we have to get it accomplished, we'll work late into the night, and we'll, we'll catch up on the weekends, we'll sleep in. And that you know, kind of makes sense, but your findings and sleep study findings in general say, no, that's not the case. You, you literally cannot catch up. Is, is that true? Yeah, I mean, I, I think catching up, you do people, you do see the pattern, right? When you have, you know, if you look at patterns of people sleeping in during the week and and, and weekends, and we look, we see that in our in the data of our Aura users as well. Uh, you see this pattern quite clearly: shorter, you know, sleep opportunity during the week, and then people try to catch up during the evenings. And there are actually some really interesting. Um, cultural differences as well. If you look at, you know, people across different countries, you see different patterns sort of emerging. Uh, but you, you, you know, I, I, I think that this this pattern of people sleeping less, whether it's weekdays or certain days, you know, when there there is um, more work or stress, and then trying to catch up is it happens, and we all do that, right? I think we, we probably all, as you did, give your example. I think we've all done that. Um, the science, I think, is building up to say that. It's not. It's not that by catching up, you are essentially erasing any of the negative impacts. Right? It, it probably helps in some ways to just catch up. So I, you know, it's not a bad thing to do to sleep more if you have been sleep deprived. But at the same time, have building a lifestyle around this idea of I'll deprive myself of sleep for a few days and then I'll catch up during the weekend, or you know, um, it's the, the science is increasingly telling us that that is not a sustainable approach to, to, to sleeping. I think one of the most foundational things you can do for, for sleeping well and, and your health is to just build a very consistent sleep schedule. Um, and I think that is also one of the things that, you know, Aura users learn very quickly is, you know, just build a consistent sleep schedule, introduce good sleep hygiene into your, into your evenings, right? Um, how you wind down. I guess things that you, if you start doing these things consistently, you know, you will you will see better sleep and better health as a result of it. Yeah, uh, you know, part of this, I think, is we now know that you know, we have multiple 24-hour clocks within us. Um, we have a 24-hour clock in our brain. Our gut microbiome operates on a 24-hour clock. And we obviously have clock genes in all of our cells. And I th think, uh, I tell my patients, essentially, you can't beat the clock. Uh, you may try to, but this whole idea that we should be, you know, in time with our circadian rhythms, I'm convinced, right. uh, I just got back from one of the major microbiome meetings in Paris, and we're more and more convinced that a large part, or at least a significant part, of jet lag is actually our microbiome clock doesn't <clears throat> catch up with our sunlight clock, and that it's the lag in our microbiome that's actually causing changes in the biochemical productions that they are affecting our brain with. So uh, there's still a lot to learn about all of this. Yeah, no, I think the science is fascinating and it's still, you know, there, there's so much that we need to learn. Um, and, and as I was mentioning, I think before, before we started recording, um, sleep has been thought of as predominantly a brain process, but it is a full body process, right, Re in reality. I think that's just how we've been measuring it. And as the science evolves, I think we'll learn that sleep is connected to pretty much every aspect of, of our physiology and, 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 and all the processes that, in, that, that, in our, that happen in our bodies. Um, so it is, it is fascinating. And, and that's one of the reasons why I feel like 
you know, um, Aura's early focus on sleep was was quite visionary, right? You know, in 2013, if you think back, um, most of the wearables were focusing on counting steps or, you know, activity tracking and those types of things. Sleep was not necessarily a big part of the conversation. Um, and, and, um, and so the foresight, you know, was, was quite remarkable in terms of in focusing on sleep and really going deeper into understanding your sleep. Okay, we talked about time of sleep, but probably more important, and I think you guys are really leading the way on this, is sleep efficiency. What, what happens from the time you go to bed till the time you get up the next day? Yeah. What, I mean, come on, I go, I go to bed, I go to sleep, and then I get up. Uh, that's pretty simple, but you're saying there's a lot happening that you probably ought to know about during that time period. So, so what's, yeah. what's sleep efficiency? Yeah, sleep sleep is is a fascinating process, and and I, you know, I, I think that I've I've uh, in terms of learning, I you know, I've, I've probably just scratched the surface of what you know the um, how sleep is uh, from a function point of view and and the physiology of of sleep and things like that. Uh, so there's a lot happens uh, you know during sleep. Sleep efficiency, you know, to answer your specific question, sleep efficiency is a very simple metric that just tells you. How well did you sleep? So it is essentially describing um, the amount of essentially person you, you went to bed and you woke up. In between that time, how much time did you sl- spend sleeping? So when we are sleeping, we go through these stages. There, there at a high level, there are four stages of sleep: wake, um, REM, light, and deep. And light and deep can be subdivided into two more stages each so n1 n2 and n3 and 4 and i can i can talk more about that but at, at a high level there are these four stages and and most of our nights we cycle through these stages right um and and typically i think we experience um, about four to five 90 minute cycles of these stages right sort of these cyclical patterns um and and essentially efficiency tells you that you know how much how much of this time were you in the wake state and and how much of the time was spent in the rest of the stages, right? So it's a high level metric, but it's a very powerful metric that tells you how well you are sleeping. When you're giving your your body the opportunity to sleep, how well are you able to take advantage of that opportunity? opportunity? And then you can, you know, from sleep efficiency, you can go deeper into understanding, you know, when you are sleeping, how is your sleep architecture? Is how much time are you spending in your light, light sleep, REM sleep, deep sleep? Each of these stages has their own significance in terms of the benefits and what they do for your body and mind. Um, and so sleep efficiency is the first place you would want to start. But then, you know, you also want to go deeper into, you know, how, how you're sleeping in, in terms of the stages. Thanks so much for watching, but don't go anywhere. This next one is sure to surprise you. Many of these patients come to me after being seen by physicians or naturopaths and are told they have adrenal fatigue. None of these people have adrenal fatigue. What they have is leaky gut and inflammation leading to insulin resistance.